Throughout my childhood and adolescence, I played college football for four years. Men like me were raised to exile a lot. To lock away all kinds of thoughts and emotions that weren't masculine. Dr. Dick Schwartz is a pioneer of a powerful method that is based on a radical view of the mind. It's called Internal Family Systems. IFS. 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 Internal Family Systems Method. And it can help you resolve inner limitations and get you out of unconscious trauma and into your true powerful self. When I've tried to approach some people, there's a fear that if they start digging up their past or reliving trauma, that there's no positive outcome that comes from that. How do you explain to someone like that what the benefit might be? Many people have had terrible experiences they never want to feel again and they've tried their best to keep those locked away inside. You don't go back and grovel in it. You actually go back and help the parts of you that are stuck back there. People with moderate to severe PTSD after 16 IFS sessions only one still qualified for PTSD. I would encounter an experience where I was certain if I let go I would utterly fall apart. It would be an utter and total collapse from which I would never recover. You know, if, if you want, we could just do a piece of work while people listen too. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you so much for taking the time. I, uh, I, I've read your book once and I speed read it in advance of this conversation. And <laughs> <laughs> it always reminds me to check back in with parts that I haven't talked to in a while. So I appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, I appreciate you doing the, the whole work. Yeah. <laughs> I do do my homework. So I actually want to start for people that haven't necessarily taken therapy or might not be familiar with IFS at all. To that, let's call them a practically minded person. What do you see as the benefits of IFS in particular? Because I know that when I've tried to approach some people, there's a fear that if they start digging up their past or reliving trauma, that there's no positive outcome that comes from that. And it's just the pain of experiencing things that they would prefer to leave in the dust. So before we get into what it is, how do you explain to someone like that what the benefit might be? Well, you know, uh, there is a point to that because mm -hmm. most people, when they've tried that or tried to remember or go back there, it has been very painful and overwhelming a lot of the time because many people have had terrible experiences they never want to feel again, and they've tried their best to keep those locked away inside. So I totally get that fear. What it turns out, though, that there's a way to do it without the overwhelm. And when you do do it, you don't go back and grovel in it. You actually go back and help the parts of you that are stuck back there, unload all the feelings and beliefs they got from those experiences, and then they transform. They actually heal. So we do it not just to wallow in it, we do it to actually transform it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like if, if done unskillfully, which people without guidance might do, that there, there is a potential to, let's say, re-traumatize or just not see benefit from that reviewing the past process. Absolutely. You know, and that happens. Uh, it happens to people who maybe uh, try psychedelics mm. early on and, and don't, uh, don't work to make sure that doesn't happen. And so that opens the lid on something that just uh, takes over and gives them what's called a bad trip. You know? <laughs> so uh, so it, it can happen just by running into something similar to some bad childhood experience and having it all rush out over you. So many people have had experiences where they, they felt it again because it got triggered and have once again, swore I never want to go there again. Mm. Got it. So, but, go ahead. I was just going to say, but we learned how to do it in a very safe way. Uh, had it, you know, it's kind of involved, but uh, it's possible, as I was saying earlier, to do it uh, without being overwhelmed. Mm. So that's, you know, I, I think it's good that we got. Uh, that concern out of the way up front because a lot of people go, well, I don't want to do that. And I think that speaks to that. What do you have an example of like a really positive outcome that you've seen in terms of what people can expect perhaps in reduction in stress or anxiety or a, f a feeling of inner freeness? I'm just curious of what the, uh, some of the positive outcomes that you've seen in the past, particularly if there's one that just really surprised you. Well, uh, we've seen all of that. You know, we have some outcome studies one was with people with um, moderate to severe PTSD, for example. 
And after your 16 IFS sessions, only one still qualified for PTSD. So mm. it can actually work pretty quickly. Uh, and, and that's, again, a testament to the fact that and those people actually went back to their traumas and were, were able to bring the parts of them stuck back there into the present and help them unload all the feelings and beliefs I got back there. And when that happens, then the anxiety protectors, the parts that are protecting uh, one stuck in the past that I call exiles, uh, those anxious parts now see they don't have to protect that so much. And they, they also can get caught up to the fact you're not still living in a traumatic scene because all these parts get stuck back there. They still think you're five years old a lot of the time. <clears throat> so helping them see that there's a you, you know, there's a Charlie who's not stuck back there who can actually help them, what I call yourself, uh, is a big relief that you're not living back there. You're actually living in a safe, you know, if that's true for you, living in a safe environment. And uh, and they can come live with you. They don't have to stay back there. Mm. And then the anxiety goes way, way down. So anxiety goes on. I mean, I know that I've seen uh, through IFS and, and supporting things like breath work, I have become aware uh, that, I, that I wasn't, that I had a previous level of internal conflict, which I had no idea about. And people might be able to relate to this where they say, you know, part of me wants to do this, but part of me doesn't want to do this. Or one that I've heard a lot that I now have a radar for is, you know, I shouldn't feel angry about this, <laughs> which is which is part of me is furious. And, mm -hmm. and I know that it's not socially acceptable from another part, but I did not realize the amount of inner conflict I had. And as there, uh, I've been able to bring some more healthy resolution to that unconscious conflict, energy, creativity, lack of anxiety, like w mm -hmm. just, I, I did not realize how that energy could be applied in different directions. And I'm sure you've seen outcomes like that. That's great to hear, and, and yes, indeed, because when you have all these parts exiled, locked away, uh -huh. because they now carry these burdens of memories and sensations and emotions from traumas or from bad experiences, uh, generally those are the, the most vulnerable parts of you that got hurt the most by those experiences. And before they were hurt, they were the most creative parts of you, were the most open and, and playful and loving and joyful. Mm -hmm. And now you don't have access to their qualities anymore because you've got them in some inner basement back, back there. So uh, just opening the door to all of that, you, you start getting more creative as you heal those parts and you, you, you add on all the stuff that you had, you had uh, locked out. Mm. So we've been talking about IFS and it, and we've implied, but there's uh, there's some assumptions that are built in that I think are very contradictory to what has been the worldview prior to this. And you call it the mono mind. I'm sure you've talked about it ad infinitum. So I'll tee you up for it, which is basically the idea that we've been chatting that it is uh, not a very useful model to consist to see any person as a singular psyche totally unified in its desires and wants and beliefs. And in fact, we have several sub-personalities that are not just metaphorical, but actual, you can call them an entity, I don't know, but a, a, a being that you can visit inside of yourself with an inner dialogue that has a voice, a desire, and needs that might feel very different from the one that you present to the world. Uh, and through these conversations and through understanding them, pulling them out of the basement like you talked about, you can experience a tremendous amount of inner healing. So I just want to <laughs> lay out sort of what we are talking about because I did start with the benefits there. Uh, yeah, it's a nice summary, Charlie. I appreciate it. And uh, so these are real inner subpersonalities. People, for example, with the diagnosis of what used to be called multiple personality disorder, uh, they are not are not different from us, except that their system got blown apart more. So there's these barriers between them, but their full range personality is just like we have, and so that's what we're talking about. And you know, I didn't believe that coming into this. I I stumbled onto this discovery because I had some clients who at first I thought were really really sick because they were talking about them, their parts as 
these full range personalities. And then I noticed, well, I've got them too, actually. <laughs> and some of mine are as extreme as theirs. And then I just got curious. And it turns out, as you're saying, we all have them. And it's a good thing to have them because they all have these valuable qualities and resources for us. But trauma and attachment injuries, which is bad parenting, basically, force them out of their naturally valuable states into roles that can be extreme and damaging. Mm. But that's not who they are. And then people get labeled based on those roles that dominate their lives. And uh, that, that they become the model mind. That one mind is an alcoholic, or one, your one mind is somehow pathologized. When it's just a protector, protective part that's taken over, mm. and there is still what I call the self, and there's lots of other parts who uh, can be brought to bear, and, and the, even that protector can be helped to see. It doesn't have to run your life that way. Mm. Uh, there's two things that I want to come back to multiple personalities because you touched on that, but it, it just occurs to me at the end that the title of your book, No Bad Parts, there's a deep deep implication about that, which is we see the alcoholic, the abuser, these uh, behaviors that people uh, exhibit that in the view of IFS are when they become blended with one of these protector parts. And the right. idea is that if, if brought to resolution, if understood more deeply, all of these parts at some level are open to and desire a different way of being, but have got caught up in these behaviors, which also is a really powerful implication about people. I mean, there's a whole like philosophy and ethic that basically says people are good at their core. That's right. Yeah, it's a very different paradigm for understanding the human mind. And uh, it does say that. It says there is this self in everybody, it's, and it can't be damaged, and it's just beneath the surface of these parts, so that when they open space, it pops out. And knows how to lead and knows how to heal, knows how to relate internally in a healing way, knows how to relate interpersonally in a healing way. And that's the big deal about IFS. I mean, it's nice to know that these parts are what they seem and that they can be transformed. But, you know, what blew my mind when I stumbled into it was even people that had horrible, horrible childhoods, as we opened some space, that same self would pop out and suddenly, instead of being terrified or furious, they would be calm and, and uh, confident and even have compassion for the part we're working with or some person. And so there are all these C words that characterize self. They're what we call the eight Cs. And I just mentioned three. The others are uh, curious, curiosity, clarity, creativity, uh, connectedness, and I always forget one. Forget. <laughs> um, Clarity again. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> well, I said creativity. I, courage, courage. Courage. Got it. Yeah. And so that, that speaks to the benefits of this. And I think particularly my audience, when they hear confidence, creativity, uh, clarity, I know those are three that I think are the value that you can get from a process like IFS in terms of those things uh, very much surprised me when I started doing it because I was someone who found courage and confidence by changing my outer world by and by changing my approach to my outer world. And I think that's a beautiful and valid way for somebody to develop reference experiences of their own capability. But Recently, I have seen far greater gains from those sort of inner resolutions. And I actually think that some of that is developmental. I think there's a period of time where you got to mm -hmm. go out in the world and make stuff happen. And there's a period of time where you got to return inside. Uh, but I do want people to know that in terms of really like practical considerations, creativity, confidence, courage, all those sorts of things, this is something that can help you find deeper levels of all of those. That's really true. And, uh, and to get there, not for everybody, but for lots of people who've had really bad backgrounds, you have to do a lot of healing first. Mm -hmm. And that involves accessing some of those eight Cs and then bringing that to these parts that are in these terrible places still, mm. and then helping them out and out of the roles that they've been forced into. It's sort of like in a 
you know, I, I, I'm trained as a family therapist, and we used to work with families where there were kids who were forced into very extreme roles because of the dynamics of the family. And it wasn't who they were, but it's, they felt like they had to do this to distract from the parents' conflict, for example, or, or to be a kind of scapegoat for their issues, or, or to protect themselves in the family. But you fix the family, and they're released from that role, and then they're, they're able to be who they're designed to be. Mm. Same is true of these parts. So they're all good, no bad parts, but they're, many of them are forced into these extreme roles that they don't like, but they think are necessary, partly because they think you're still a child and you still need their kind of protection. Mm. But they're longing to be who they're really designed to be, which is always valuable. Mm. So before we get too far, because I want to continue there, I, I mentioned it, you'd mentioned multiple personalities. I'm so curious how you see the connection of of your work with IFS connecting with what was classically talked, I don't know, dissociative identity or multiple personality disorder. Do you see that, you mentioned it was like an explosion of what naturally occurs in a lot of people. How, how do you understand the link? Uh, the link between IFS and, and that? What, population so what when I think when people probably first encountered someone who had multiple personalities, they were blown away and shocked, and they see movies like Split, where this person is just transforming. Yeah. How do you understand what is occurring psychologically within that individual? Well, most and I've worked with a number of those clients, and most of them have had horrible childhoods. Mm -hmm. And one way when you when you're abused chronically to handle that is to kind of split apart, you know, have, mm -hmm. have uh, some parts go one direction, others go in another direction, and have these kind of amnesic barriers between them so that if, if you're getting pummeled by a father, uh, one part will stay and take the beating so others get protected and leave. Mm -hmm. And by leave, I mean dissociate. And so the, there are these dissociative kind of disconnects among them, and and because the abuse is often chronic and uh, unrelenting, uh, they don't know about self at all. They they think they're the self. They they really believe they have to run everything. And so, when I first started working with that population, I kind of bought into it that they're the ones running the ship steering the boat. Mm. But at some point, I started trying the same process of asking them to just open some space, and it's the same self that popped out mm. and could take over. Um, but sometimes they didn't like that because they thought they were the self and they felt displaced, and so it was a big to-do. But uh, that's working with that population, with that kind of history, is part of what convinced me itself is in everybody. It can't be damaged. Mm. Uh, so, and is accessible whenever they trust it's safe enough to open space for it. Mm. And when I was working with that population, though, I became the self to the system initially because I, I had to form relationships with each of them. I would be talking to them directly. And as they started to trust me, then they start to be willing to open space when I ask them to. Mm. So have you been able to work with those people and see some sort of um, more stable reintegration of a personality that wasn't splitting as uh, uncontrollably? Yeah. So as I'm doing that, you know, I'm working with one over here, and I'm getting to know the other over here. At some point I'm asking, are you guys willing to talk to each other directly? Mm -hmm. And as is true in a lot of abuse systems, there are many polarizations. There are parts that hate each other and never want to have anything to do with each other. So, But if they both trust me, then they'll come together. Again, it's just like family therapy. Two polarized family members come together, and my job is to help them be decent to each other and mm. try to go over some of their issues. I'm doing the same thing with these very polarized parts of people. And as other parts see that that's helping, 
then they become open to that possibility too. And so one of the goals of IFS is to depolarize, to bring more harmony to these parts by helping them get to know each other and start to see they're, they're not all that different. They all have the same thing in common, which is the well-being of you. It's just that they've taken these very extreme opposite roles. And, and in getting to know one another, do those patients find that there's less, you know, taking over of one part at a yeah, time? Yeah, very much. Okay. Yeah. And they're, they're able to, I, I suppose, have self sort of lead more often or at the very least dictate, okay, I'm going to allow my very angry or my very hurt part to like sort of run the show for a moment. Exactly right. That's exactly what happens. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So that, uh, the, you mentioned families, I'll take us back to where we were and how children can start to uh, take on roles. And uh, I was struck in reading your book for the second time, how you, you've got the systems approach to it. You know, it's internal family systems. And, uh, you mentioned in addition to families, nations, and all of these different kinds of things going on. And so I'm curious if we zoom out and we say, you know, what's going on at a high level with not necessarily America, but uh, my audience has a lot of men in it. And they're, one of the things that comes up is men's mental health, that there seems to be an increasing rise in, uh, well, suicide, in uh failure to launch where men are like staying home longer. There's this question of masculinity, which is, okay, it's not this aggressive, toxic thing. What is it supposed to be? I'm curious from your systems view, how do you see that? What do you see happening? Uh, in terms of what's happening currently with men? Yes, yes. You know, I, I'm not, I can't say with any kind of certainty, but typically, uh, men like me were raised to exile a lot, to to lock away all kinds of thought, thoughts and emotions that weren't masculine and be dominated by these parts that kept us in our heads and very competitive and uh, aggressive in some ways too. So you can succeed in this culture. And this being a kind of rugged individualist culture also, to put away any time we got hurt, just leave that in the dust. Don't mm -hmm. look back. Uh, just move on. Don't show vulnerability. Don't let them see you, you sweat. Uh, and and I, th I think that had its, its own downside, and I've done a lot of work to kind of counter that in myself mm -hmm. and gone to the parts that had been so unacceptable throughout my childhood and adolescence. I played college football for four years. So, yeah. I mean, you exile a lot of stuff <laughs> at my size to run full speed into somebody almost twice my size. Yeah, so. yeah, pain receptors you have to turn <laughs> off for a period of time. Absolutely. I tell you, rely on these dissociating parts, mm -hmm. so on. So, so that had its own downside. And I think... Uh, with with the sort of debunking of that masculinity, that that uh, there isn't something that's clear that's replaced it, mm -hmm. and that that's very confusing now, and especially with all the the gender questions and uh, you know what kind of sexuality do I like and all of that. I, I'm I'm really glad I missed. <laughs> I missed a lot of that because <laughs> it, it doesn't seem that much better in some ways. Hmm. Just uh, makes it all very confusing. Got it. And yeah. Do you I mean, but for me, for me, the sine qua non is are you exiling parts of you to be who you think your, your gender role is supposed to be? Hmm. So, and go ahead. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, your approach is is very internal looking. It's it's let me find who I am by searching my inner landscape. And yeah. uh, 
I'm wondering if there is a value towards of a template of a template for what this is. This is a good man. This is a good woman. Not something to be bound by entirely. But what you sort of described is there's a lot. I remember being a teenager and you try on different clothes, you try on different things, and it can feel overwhelming when anything is possible. And there's not more definition around what sort of templated paths I might try. So I'm just wondering, and I don't, I, I don't know if you have a thought or an answer on this of where is the balance between I'm constraining you in a way that is supportive of your growth and I'm uh, allowing you utter total freedom, which is actually debilitating? Yeah. You know, it may well be that um, we've moved from that very constraining masculinity mm -hmm. to, to the opposite extreme where anything goes mm -hmm. and, and how confusing that is. Um, uh, I'm beginning for me. Not only the the sort of way you judge if something's healthy is whether or not you're exiling, but it's also there is the self, and I think so often now men believe that they have to lead with a part that uh, when I think of that that uh, I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say, <laughs> that, that to conform, they have to embrace a kind of masculinity that isn't necessarily natural to them. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in doing that, they're leaving this self with its eight Cs. Yeah. And so if we can bring that back into the lead, and have from that place people explore all these different parts. Yeah. Some of which might even have different genders and so on. But have the conversation inside so that the parts work out whenever they need to and everybody is sitting around the table agreeing to how they want you to be rather than uh, hearing that Socially, you're supposed to be a certain way and trying to be that way. Yeah, I don't know if I'm being clear. No, but. no, you are. You're you're consolidating some ideas in my mind, which is it sounds like, and I think we're culturally aware that there was an era. I don't know whether it was thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, a thousand years ago, where the exiles in men were weakness, tears, uh, like a big display of grief, uh, romanticism, perhaps, and. While we have sort of brought some of those back into the fold, I think we've made new exiles out of aggression, the desire to dominate, uh, strong sexual urge. There, there are other things that have become new exiles. And I know that I have found difficulty because my, I was, my generation is split between kind of both of them, where it was don't be weak growing up. And then there's, but also don't be dominant and aggressive sort of, sort of entered yep. the scene as I was in my teens and then became the predominant. Thing. So I find myself on both sides having some difficulty contacting both of them. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's a great description of the dilemma now. Mm -hmm. Better than I could articulate, but I think that's right. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> but, you teed me up for it, and uh, I've been thinking yeah. about it all week in preparation. Um, alongside of this, and I want, we can come back to the individual, but since we're on the, the larger group, uh, I was thinking about trigger warnings as I sort of uh, was going through your book again. And it seems again that we've moved from one unhealthy extreme in suck it up, deal with it. Does it bother you to hear, hear that joke about your weight or whatever? Like, doesn't matter. You need to get tough. Yeah. All the way to if somebody says something that makes you feel a feeling that is uncomfortable, the way to address that is by shutting them down and stopping that from ever coming up. So it seems that that actually what has happened is this pendulum has swung, which I think it tends to do from unhealthy extreme to a, another unhealthy extreme, passing that that middle point. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm. You know, it is important to be thoughtful and to, to not say things that are going to offend somebody. And so that's the good side of the shift. Mm -hmm. uh, but for people to feel mortally wounded by things that uh, aren't, aren't not that threatening and to then respond 
from these very righteous places isn't serving anybody. And so I've been working a lot with leading social activists mm -hmm. to try and help them do their activism from self rather than from these righteous places and judgmental places. And also to help them with the, the fear they have of pursuing whatever it is they're doing. And, and when they can do it from self, it's an entirely different yeah. response they get. They get an entirely different response from uh, their, their uh, opponents, for example. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really poignant part of the book and a brave of the person to allow you to sort of talk about it for those who haven't read it. There's a, a story that you tell of an activist who is deeply involved, who lives sort of off grid, lights candles at night, and is very interested in many of the different large scale problems that the world is facing. And it comes up in his relationship with his wife where she says, can we get a small extension on our already small house? And he goes, but there are children that have nothing. <laughs> you know, it, it just gets him, you know, the, the weight of the world is on his shoulders and in this is what I've seen in my life that I think has turned me off of some of the activists because I, I do have this, that openness, but when I feel that it's coming from a yep. uh, an inauthentic expression of what the, is actually happening, I, I resist it. And so you went through this process of IFS with him, and he describes how when he was a teenager, his dad died in a car accident to a drunk driver, and he thought that he maybe should have been in the car with him, that instead he went to go play uh, with his friends at the arcade, and he developed this belief of sup my superficiality can kill, and so does superficiality mm -hmm. generally. Then he went to school, and no one cared. They went on like life just, you know, their lives hadn't changed, and he said, I'm mm -hmm. the only one that notices this, and it is my duty to protect life. So you have this, this person with this horrible personal trauma who has that intense energy, and it comes out in both a beautiful and a somewhat I don't want to say destructive, but it's inauthentic and I think therefore alienating. We got to save the whales and the world and the this, and there's no extensions to the house and it's it's imbalanced. And I've seen that and it came through in a number of your stories about activists, which is there's this beautiful core of tenderness and compassion that is surrounded by this uh, fierce, almost it, like difficulty of, of addressing the, the core wound that has driven that. Yeah, that's, all true and very well described, and uh, and the the odd thing is, and, and this is what I'm trying to bring, is that what I'm calling self isn't just compassionate, because mm -hmm. a lot of times these protective parts think, well, if I don't do it, you're just going to be a marshmallow. You're not going to mm -hmm. stand up for for what's right. You're not going to keep the, keep going, but among those eight C's are confidence, courage, and clarity. And it's the clarity to see injustice and then the confidence and the courage to act against it, but to do it with compassion, mm -hmm. another C word. So uh, that, when you lead that way, you tend to, to do it in an entirely different tone of voice and facial expression, and, and you're no less... Uh, effective and forceful. Mm -hmm. so. I found that in a number of, they weren't traditional sessions, they were somewhat psychedelic journeys and things like that, where I would encounter an experience where I was certain if I let go, I would utterly fall apart. If I let go yeah. of this way of being, of this, you could call it the rigidity with which I held my body, this the the rigidity with which I held a particular belief about breaking down, that it would be an utter and total collapse from which I would never recover. And it's for me, it took both support, guidance of other people who would hold down the self in that moment and see yeah. beyond that experience, which was enti entirely consuming for me in that moment. I was you know, dead certain that these things were 100% true. But uh, it also took, I think, there's a bit of faith that you can be caught by something larger mm -hmm. than your fears than your survival fears that there is part of you that is deeper wider more intelligent than the things that keep you that you think keep you surviving day to day yeah, yeah i'm glad you got got up here too because uh, for me what i'm calling self and i came to this kicking and screaming because i come from a very 
scientific, non-spiritual family. Mm -hmm. But I just kept seeing over and over when we access self, even if people had horrible childhoods, it had this, it was the same person. And so I came to believe, which I still believe, that what I'm calling self is a drop of the big ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this big self that has a lot of different names, including God, non-dual, and, and, and psychedelics can help you access that. You feel this utter, pure connectedness to everything. And that we then, you know, it's like quantum physics talks about photons are both a particle and a wave. That's the wave state. And then when we come back into our bodies, we particleize. It's the same self, but it has boundaries. It's in this body now. <clears throat> and it feels more separate and so on. But it's for me, that's what self is. It's, mm -hmm. it's um, sort of sacred in that way. And that's why it can't be damaged. Mm. And... Uh, how do we get on this? Well, uh, you were saying that you came to this kicking and screaming, and I, I felt that it was funny. I don't know if you over the process of writing, but you start your book off and you're like, you know, I don't take any spiritual sides and I don't know about any of that. And by the final chapter, <laughs> you've <laughs> got the word sacred and all of this. So I don't know if you were, as you were writing, you were having that. Could you tell me a little bit about the kicking and screaming resistance of, of coming to where you are now? Yeah. I mean, my father was very anti-religious mm -hmm. and not just, you know, agnostic or atheistic. And so I had him in my head all the time mm. as I was doing this, <clears throat> and particularly when he was al alive. And um, so, but the data just kept showing up. I just couldn't explain what I was running into any other way. I tried. Tried evolutionary explanations, tried a lot of other explanations. And it wasn't until some students actually said, well, this sounds like Atman in Hinduism. Mm -hmm. This is sort of like Buddha nature, or you know, every spiritual tradition has a word for it. And when I would look at that, I'd say, oh yeah, they're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so then I started to get much more curious about spirituality and how what I was finding might relate to that. And then, you know, I start meditating, and in meditation, I could enter that big state. I, I tried psychedelics myself, some too, and and found that also. And so that's how, you know, I, I really had to unburden a lot of the beliefs that I that had been pumped into me mm -hmm. about this whole realm to be able to talk to you the way I am now. Yeah. Me, me too, which is why I ask. I, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm a fighter. Uh, I, I think similarly, not necessarily, uh, my early experiences of religion were, without judgment, I think of people that were not very connected to, like they, they had habits that were soothing habits. I did not sense a broader connection. And the... I think one of the things that I have, uh, I'm very sensitive to, and I'm sure there's a part that is, that is up, is when I feel inauthenticity, when I feel that there's a ulterior motive or something going on, <laughs> where it's, where the stated beliefs, you know, they say they believe in this Bible, but they haven't even read it. You know, that that would just <laughs> set me off to no end, and I think that kept me away from anything that was a synonym <laughs> for religion, including spirituality, God, uh, whatever you want to say, and th similarly through a process of I think respect for the scientific method, which is. I, I, I just look and I see and I use experiments and hypotheses and I, I just try to find the theory that yeah. best suits the data uh, am opening up to it, but have still found, you know, those, those uh, resistance bands inside of myself where I go, okay, no further, <laughs> no further yeah. than here. <laughs> yeah, I've had to work a lot with those resistance bands. So yeah. I'm fully out of the closet about it now. <laughs> and, you know, what, one of the gifts my father gave me was... And, and this would echo in my head, too, as I was exploring all this, was follow the data, even if it takes you way outside your paradigm. Yeah. Stay true to the data. Don't let your theories get in the way. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that's what's, 
it's interesting because the way that people talk about science, it can often be so divorced from the scientific method. When they say yeah. science, they often refer to the consensus body of knowledge held by my culture at this particular year, which has yeah. nothing to do with the spirit and the ethos that drives understanding of the world, which I think can lead beautifully to truth eventually, you know, if you continue to, to run experiments and, and pay attention. Um, so, totally. So practically, you know, we've talked about this and obviously people could find an IFS therapist or something like that, but what can people do within themselves? Are there certain exercises that, that they can run through to get to know these different parts and start to see some of the benefits that we chatted about? Uh, you know, I've got a whole series of meditations on audio uh, with Sounds True, the publisher. Um, and I think it's called Greater Than the Sum of the Parts, which sort of answers that question. I mean, I, I could lead you and the group through one of them now if you wanted, but... Um, yeah. I mean, it, I didn't know if, if my card was going to get called, but I'd be happy to if... Uh, <laughs> okay. You know, if, if you want, I could just, we could just do a piece of work while people listen too. Yeah. Um, I was, I was a bit nervous about this, but I, it feel, it would feel, uh, like a waste of a good opportunity not to. So I'd be happy to. Okay. So is there a part of you that you'd like to get to know more, change your relationship <laughs> with a little bit? Yes. Um, I, I, uh, had a, a journey with psilocybin that I did a few weeks ago and I encountered a part that I would was certain was a bad part was and for many for a lot of resistance to get to it and I, I touched into it and it was a very very young infant part which has been tough to approach and I actually it's wonderful to have you here because it's like so young I can try words but it is it is a feeling that yeah. arises in yeah. me um, that's right yeah so I've not known exactly, even with the sort of structure, how to work with this part. Okay, yeah. So we, we work with a lot of pre-verbal parts mm -hmm. that don't have words, and we just do it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So if you're up for it, we can, we can help that part. Oh, boy. Let's, yeah, this is a big one for me, so I would, I would love to. Okay. So go ahead and focus on the feeling or sensation of that and find that in your body or around your body. Mm -hmm. Where do you find it? My heart. And how do you feel toward it as you notice it there? Scared. Frightened. Okay. <clears throat> so that makes sense, I think. Well, we're going to ask the scared one to relax back. Maybe even go into a safe waiting room for a little while in there. So we can just get to know this very, very young one. Mm. and maybe help it heal. Because we can't do that if you stay this scared. Yeah, the I'm getting a message, which is, you know, it's parting. It's like very, you know, parting words. Like, you be very, very careful is the, is the sense that I'm getting. And tell that part, I, I heard that, mm -hmm. and we will. I'll make sure we're very, very careful. Mm -hmm. Was it willing to pull its fear out of you for a little while? I feel a large portion of the fear withdrawn, but there's there's a watchful eye, I would say. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The part can hang around and keep an eye on things. Mm -hmm. But focus again on the, one, the target part and tell me how you feel toward it now. Um, yeah, overwhelmed. In, in a, in, uh, I don't want to put a label, good, bad. Uh, it, like it's very, very sweet. Like it's very, very um, beautiful is what I feel. Let it know you see that now. And see how it reacts to being seen. It's, yeah, it's the, the, um, the way this part relates is I think like an infant, like it, it merges and blends so much. Like the idea of being seen is almost, it's, it's just a felt sense of the quality of experience changing a little bit. Okay. So describe the change a little bit. It's like a baby when you look at it, like it rolls a little bit more and like, you know, yeah. brightens up a little bit. Uh, yep. Yep. That's great. 
So let's just hang with it a minute more or two until it really trusts, seems to trust that you care about it and that you, you want to help it. So just convey that in whatever way feels right until you really sense it trusts you now, that you're not afraid of it. I will say that I'm, and I don't know if this is the same part or different, but I, there's a, which has been a, a hallmark of this dynamic, which is a push pull. There's an approach and a pull. And then, and so what I notice is um, I can feel myself sort of start to pull it in and cradle it. And I feel an opening. And then I feel fear that I will hurt this part. I, f yeah. I feel, um, so that's how I feel about children generally. Like I'm afraid to, to, to hurt them. So, Ask that part, that's another protector, mm -hmm. to also feel a space and let it know I'm going to make sure nothing bad happens here. I know what I'm doing. <clears throat> Who is I? You, Dick, or me, Charlie, knows what we're doing. <laughs> me, me, Dick. Dick knows me, what Dick. he's doing. Okay. Dick, Dick is in. Yeah, the feel and it's like be very gentle with the babe is like that's sort of what I'm hearing. So well, that's entirely what we plan to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Charlie, are you feeling gentle toward the baby? Yes, if anything, overly gentle, which I think is characterized my is is like so scared to yeah. connect. I would say. Yeah, so just ask that part to give us a little mm -hmm. more space. Ask it to trust you and me, Bob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel, be I feel yeah. a bit more space. All right, good. So in a gentle way, go ahead and uh, be with this baby. And how, how close to it are you in terms of feet away? Can you tell? Like a long... Like imagine my finger and it can grab my finger distance away. But okay. yeah. Good. So and it's still reacting positively to you being there. Yes. From it's again, it's like inner and outer is very different from this thing's parts beings perspective. But yes. It's a and see if it would like you to even touch it somehow. Just we want to be careful about that, but see if it's open to you. Yeah, the hesitation is not from this part. The hesitation is from the other parts of the, the right. feet. So, um, but just keep reassuring them that we're going to be very careful and that babies like being touched in general. Yeah, I could... Uh, <laughs> Yes, it feels um, again another uh, like an overwhelming good feeling. I would say, or is approaching. If that good, yeah. Let's just stay with us for a little while, mm -hmm. Charlie. Just keep, however, it feels right to hold the baby or touch him. Whatever feels right. Yeah, right now, a, a, both on both ends, a comfortable and safe distance feels like interactive, like, you know, it, it can grab my fingers type thing. Good. Yeah. And somehow convey that it's safe with you. And if, if it feels right to let it know you're sorry it's taken you so long to be there for it this way. Yeah, it's uh, it's very different from any of the other parts work I've done. Again, because I, I'm sort of imagining myself toggling back and forth between an older me expressing and 
touching. And then I imagine, you know, how does it feel from the inside? And it's, um, yeah, it feels calm right now. I would say it feels, um, I don't feel a, a, a strong need. I feel it just being, I would say. Okay, good. That's a good feeling. It is a. I'm just sort of like this thing when you see a baby who's just kind of sitting in a stroller, like chilling, yes. <laughs> like he's just okay. he's just hanging out. <laughs> okay. Um. So ask him if he'd like you to do this on some kind of regular basis with him. Yeah, the feeling, again, it's strange from inside of this, which I don't, you can direct me, is like how it understands this is like a merging, like a, uh, and that, yeah. and it, and the answer is yes to that. And are you willing to try and do that for it? Yes. All right, so let it know you're going to keep doing this. And we don't have time to spend more with it. Mm -hmm. that you'll return this way. Mm -hmm. And then let's go back to those protectors mm. who are so afraid to let you do this and just see how they're reacting. There's like a sigh of relief from like I'm scared you're going to hurt the baby type of thing and then and then perhaps another part is like feeling shame around having resisted that experience sort of not a bit not a bit it's quite common mm -hmm. yeah good well, I'm glad for the relief and thank the parts for taking the risk and letting us do this mm -hmm. and ask if they would be willing to let you do this much on your own as well. Again, it's just like gently, gently, like slowly, yeah. gently is the, the feedback yeah. that I'm getting. Okay. Okay. Does that feel complete for now? One thing that I'm going to do that I've learned that sometimes after an experience like this, I can have a contraction and uh, a real that I'm is authentic for me is a deep respect for the protector parts, I think. Yeah. And um, I think one of the things that I brought to this was a problem solver's approach in the past where I was like, I've got this obstacle in my way. I've got the goal yep. and I need to yep. circumvent my obstacle to hit my goal. And yep. uh, that, that got, that paradigm was not helpful to me. And so like a real, even without knowing the purpose that they they did, actually getting to know my protectors better and like why totally, this totally. happened has been as de as important as the exiles, if not, you know, I won't say more. But totally, yeah. As if we had more time, that would have been the next step. Mm -hmm. Would be to ask these parts what happened in the past to make them so afraid of hurting a child or a baby, mm -hmm. and get them out of where they're stuck with that. Mm -hmm. Those beliefs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I can, I, I have a pretty, uh, I don't have the exact moment, but I'm the oldest of two. I was two years older, I can imagine, and hear a, an adult's voice, e? don't, don't hurt the baby, don't hurt the baby type. I bet that's right. Thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But beautiful. Yeah. The, uh, I think one thing that I appreciate about this, and I don't want to let anybody know, is it, as you said, it's an ongoing process. There is a, uh, as fast as you've described this is, and I think that's why I like it. In fact, I like to often pair it with, well, I should ask you, um, you mentioned psychedelics. What other modalities do you like to pair with this sort of parts uh, approach? Or the, for instance, I don't know if you do breath work or anything like that or uh, anything. I don't personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of a purist, but there are lots of people combining 
IFS with EMDR, if you know mm-hmm. that method, or a mm-hmm. uh, lot of breath work. Lots of people are doing that. Uh, I do find that combination of IFS and ketamine to be amazing. Mm-hmm. And so I've been co leading retreats uh, around that, which, uh, yeah, it just expedites the work a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We mentioned this, but I want to highlight some of the shifts the paradigm shifts that are implicit in this approach that were not in some of the Freudian or whatever psychoanalysis. And I mentioned this before, but there's a deep faith and belief that I you, has been empirically backed in your case that there are no bad parts, that when understood and explored, whatever history you have or whatever terror you have of approaching something inside of yourself, of something you may have done, you might be, no, I actually hurt that person or I actually did this. Yeah. That when you get to know these parts from the inside out, what I've experienced at least, is that the punishment and that the destruction that I felt was incoming, just from my own moral sense, has right. never materialized. It is always... Oh my God! I was trying my best, or I was I That's was right. I was exactly right. Just a good, mis- ignorant kid in disguise, or I, you know, it's always something like that. And I, I guess I should ask because I'm sure you've worked with people that have far more traumatic backgrounds and have probably inflicted far more damage. And do they, do they find the same thing as they as they dive into this? Yeah, you know, I wasn't convinced that there were no bad parts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'd, I'd been working with um, eating disorders, so we worked with the binge part and the starving part, and they turned out to be good parts and bad roles. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until I uh, consulted for two years to a treatment center for um, sex offenders and went to the parts that had raped women or molested little kids and thought, could these possibly be good parts? And when we it took a while, but when we could get the client curious about the part that did those heinous things, and it would share its secret history of how, when that client was being abused as a boy, this part looked around the room and said, "Who has power in the room? It's this guy doing this to me. I'm going to take in his energy oh. to protect him from the." this guy, and that it gets stuck with that burden on the desire to hurt vulnerability or whatever the perpetrator's energy was, and it becomes a legacy burden, and they, he does it to his kids and so on. And that's when I said, oh, there are really aren't any bad parts. Mm-hmm. Wow. So even in those circumstances, it was a wounded child stuck in a traumatized situation where it was, how do I escape and find a sense of power in this abuse? Flash forward, the person moves forward 20, 30, 40 years in their life. This part isn't updated, has a tremendous amount of actual power that they can now wield to hurt someone else. And that part is not even connected necessarily in the same way. Exactly. Mm. And, the, and a lot of these guys felt terribly ashamed and hated these parts, but were, uh, were unable to control them. If they, if they got triggered a certain amount, that part would just take over to try and make them feel better or give them power. Mm. And would, would often team up with the sexual part. Wow. So, yeah, that's what convinced me. There's, uh, in that, you mentioned that they hated these parts. And I found, again, that I've tried, as I bring more curiosity, understanding, and love to these parts, that things move. Uh, I'm wondering, and I don't think there is, but like, do we need to shift our understanding of love? Because it, it, as cheesy as it sounds, love has been the answer consistently for me, but it has been a different kind of love than I think I understood, which is the totally permissive, whatever you need kind of love. And it is a love that can be strongly boundaried, a love that is considerate of far more than I often experience. So I'm, I'm, it seems like love is the answer, as cheesy as that is, but I'm wondering what the definition of love is that is the answer. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, again, internal families. So uh, 
in that case of a, a perpetrator part, mm -hmm. you can love it, but it's hard to love until it shares why it does it. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you want to contain it. You want to control mm -hmm. it. Just like if you're a parent and an acting out kid in the family, you don't want to just be accepting of that kid. You're going to want to provide some discipline, mm -hmm. and but you want to do it from self. You don't want to do it from your raging critics or shaming parts mm -hmm. or pun punitive parts. Yeah. So, uh, so if you were to go to that one who wants to do something bad. You know, like hurt somebody, and say, "I get you really want to do this, but I can't let you do that." And I know that isn't who you are. And we're going to help you. We're going to help you unload all this desire to hurt somebody at some point, but we can't get to it just yet. It's a totally different message than God. You're horrible. You're evil. You're going to bring me down. All the kind of shaming mm -hmm. things we tell these. Parties. Yeah, and children. You know, you're being bad. You're doing. You're doing all this kind of stuff. And children, exactly. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's all parallel. And it seems like there's a, an energetic difference between punishment and discipline. And I think, as you said, discipline comes from self. Has containment. It can be firm and strong. And you are not allowed to hit your sister anymore. And <laughs> this, that is an absolute no go. And See? punishment can surface level look the same way, but carries with it this. Tone, this yeah. tone and this retribution. This is I'm going to make it even, and you will pay. You know, you're going to pay that one back in your own suffering. Uh, That's exactly right. Mm, That's right. Interesting. Well, thank you so much. I uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Before we go, I've mentioned no bad parts. You've mentioned a couple of the videos that you had. Where where should people go to learn more and check you out? Our website is uh, ifs-institute.com, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, a lot of it is geared toward therapists because mainly we're training therapists, but there are several books I've written for the public, including uh, Internal Family Systems, Intro to Internal Family Systems, uh, No Bad Parts, you mentioned, and a book called You're the One You've Been Waiting For that people seem to like a lot. Mm. And, uh, and there are videos and you know all that stuff too. So Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I encourage thank everybody. You, Charlie. Yes, try out IFS, people. I will say, we. I think uh, the one thing that I would change about IFS is the name. It sounds so academic. We need to call it like <laughs> Super Healer Central or something clickable on YouTube. <laughs> I know. It, it's gotten popular despite the name. But yes. Voila. Beautiful. It's All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Charlie. And thanks for being a good sport. Cheers.